Okay, good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I'll start off by thanking you for uh, taking the time to join in and, uh, and watch the presentation today. Uh, my name is Troy Trushinsky, and I'll be uh, doing the, running through the presentation here with you. Uh, the plan is for this to last about 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and the, uh, the, the general agenda here is I'll, I'll spend a short amount of time uh, providing a, a short overview of the AirInc 664 and AFDX uh, protocol. And then I'll dive into a description of a solution that we at AIT have supporting 10, uh, 100 megabit, and up to 1 gigabit um, end system solutions for AirInc 664 and AFDX. Again, my name's uh, Troy Trushinsky. Uh, I also have on the active slide here uh, the contact information for myself and Ken Bisson. Uh, Ken Bisson is our director of sales, and so if you have any questions about the product or, or any anything like that, you can start with Ken, and he can he can help you out, or for sure get you to uh, to somebody who can. <clears throat> so I'll start off with what is Airink 664. So what it is is it's a specification um, developed by Airink, and it defines aircraft data networks um, that utilize standard Ethernet. So IEEE 802.3 Ethernet and upper layer protocols uh, based on internet protocols. So RFCs like uh, UDP, IP, and Simple Network Management Protocol, SNMP. Uh, AirInc is uh, managed by the AirInc Network Infrastructure and Security Committee. Uh, this is the committee within AirInc that currently maintains the specification. And this, this official status of the specification is active. So it's still a very active specification, of, uh, obviously a pretty new specification, and there's, there's lots of development and activity around it um, ongoing. Airink 664 is actually a rather large spec. Uh, contains uh, it consists of, of several documents, eight of them to be exact. And what we'll mainly focus on uh, here is Part Seven. And Part Seven is uh, the definition of avionics full duplex switched Ethernet, or or a deterministic implementation of an Airink 664 network. <clears throat> so, what is AFDX in relation to Airink 664? So again, AFDX is, stands for Avionics Full Duplex Switched Ethernet, and AFDX can be best described as one implementation of, a, of deterministic Ethernet as specified in 664 Part 7. So AFDX, think of it as a, an implementation of an Airink 664 Part 7 network. AFDX was developed by Airbus originally to support the, uh, the 380 program. And it's also used on the 400M and the A350 uh, within Airbus, to, to name a couple. And AFDX is actually a trademarked term of, of Airbus. So AFDX is an Airbus uh, protocol. Similar implementations, though, of Airink 664 Part 7 uh, can also be found and are used on the Boeing 787, the Bombardier C-Series, and the Comac uh, Aira J21, uh, just to name a few, uh, I guess, programs that would be recognizable. <clears throat> okay, the, the basic uh, network components of an AFDX network. So uh, the AFDX implementations use a star topology. So you have basically a backbone or, or network fabric that's the in an interconnection of Ethernet switches. And then you have end systems that uh, gain access to the network um, via connection to a, a, you know, a, a local switch. So basically you have the switches, uh, the end systems, and then you have the 802.3 Ethernet links interconnecting um, the components. The end systems implement the, the protocol stack you know, up to, up to you know, basically the application layer. So if you looked at the protocol stack in an end system, you'd see at the low level you'd have Ethernet, uh, then you'd have IP, UDP, and the management protocols like SNMP. The switches are pure Ethernet switches, so there's no IP routing in a, an Airink 664 or AFDX network. Switches are just doing layer two Ethernet switching, so they're switching based off of Ethernet uh, MAC destination addresses. Uh, again, the links are their 802.3 standard, you know, physical 802.3 10 100 base T um, links, or in in the case of the solution that we have. Uh, also the possibility to do optical and also gigabit uh, over, uh, you know, the giggy, um, thousand base T, um, and yeah, or optical. The, I guess the central or core concept of, uh, of an Airink 664 Part 7 network is the idea of a virtual link. 
So a virtual link defines a logical data path or, or a data channel through the shared network resource. A virtual link can be characterized as having a single source and it's simplex. It, it, um, it, it defines a data flow in only one direction. So it can logically be thought of maybe similar to providing the same uh, functions as say just a simple serial data link like say an ARIN 429 link. Um, <clears throat> virtual links can also be unicast, uh, meaning they can have one or more destinations. So um, the idea again is it, it can act like say a multi-drop ARIN 429 link. You can have multiple listeners um, you know, receiving the, the multicast data that's carried on a virtual link. Within the network, uh, the Ethernet frames uh, containing the data, um, you can identify which VL those, those frames belong to or, or, or are, are part of based off of the lower 16 bits in the MAC destination address. So that, that's an AFDX switch essentially looks at those lower 16 bits and does all of the switching based on that uh, in order to provide the VL data paths through the networks. Key characteristics defining or configuring a, a virtual link are the bandwidth allocation gap, uh, which or the bag, which is specified in milliseconds, and also the maximum allowed Ethernet frame length. So together, these two parameters uh, can basically specify the maximum bandwidth, the maximum amount of the network resource that is used by the virtual link. So the bandwidth allocation gap is going to tell you the minimum time distance between transmission of consecutive frames for that virtual link so you know at fastest how how often your the VL is allowed to transmit a frame and if you also know the maximum size that that frame um, can can take up you can you know easily calculate the, the maximum amount of bandwidth that that, that VL is going to consume uh, within the network or on, on the links that, that it traverses <clears throat> another key thing that you can then calculate uh, knowing that information is the maximum jitter uh, that a VL will um, that will be experienced on a VL and in this case uh, jitter the definition of jitter is basically the difference in the maximum latency uh, and the minimum latency so the difference between the maximum time it could take a frame to go from the source to the destination on a VL and the minimum time that it could take a frame to go to from a source to a destination on a VL um, so really, essentially what, what causes jitter in a, a network like this is the fact that you may have several virtual links sharing uh, like a physical Ethernet link. And so because the bag uh, of a VL doesn't define a, a timed schedule when a frame can be transmitted, it, it just really defines a, a speed limit for a VL, you, you have the opportunity for contention. So two VLs could have frames eligible for transmission on a physical link at exactly the same time and one of those VLs frames is basically going to have to wait for the shared link um, to be transmitted in, in this case. And so that essentially that's what causes jitter. And the more VLs you you have sharing a link, um, the more possibility that you have for contention. And so therefore, as network utilization goes up, you have more VLs sharing a link, um, you have higher jitter. So the key thing though is that um, because you have the bandwidth allocation gap uh, and you have the maximum frame length, you can use all of this, this pre-configured information about the network to calculate the maximum worst case jitter for every virtual link and then have that information known for your, your, your network application and be able to deal with it and, and make sure that it, that it doesn't disrupt the application. <clears throat> Another key concept uh, provided or, or key feature provided by Airing 664 is the idea of redundancy. So every end system communicates through the network um, through a redundant network. So, so basically all the switches uh, within the network are, are replicated and you basically have two independent networks, an A side and a B side. Every end system sends data on both networks simultaneously and at the receiver the first valid frame wins. So the receiver at the very low level at the MAC level basically looks at the received frames and if it determines a duplicate is received it throws it out and ensures that the application only receives one instance of every message. The, uh, the identification of duplicate frames is done uh, by a sequence number. So this is another, I guess, special feature or special function of Airink 664 is that for each VL 
the transmitting end system places a sequence number um, that's maintained for the VL at the last byte of the MAC frame. So right in front of the Ethernet or MAC CRC is a, a byte that contains an incre incrementing sequence number for each virtual link. This is used by the, uh, again, by the receiver to identify duplicate frames and also to allow the receiving end system to, to ensure um, that frames are received in the same order they are transmitted uh, on a given virtual link. In the end systems, uh, the protocol stack looks a little something uh, like the figure that we have here. So at the bottom layer, you have an ARIC 664 MAC, and that's not a standard 802.3 Ethernet MAC. That's ARIC 664 because it includes implementation of the VL, um, you know, the enforcement of the bag, um, the traffic shaping, the, those sorts of things. So it's 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 basically not 802.3 MAC. It's an ARIC 664 MAC. Um, then at the IP layer. Um, you know, layer three there, you have IP, and that's a little different for ARIC 664 also. Um, <coughs> pardon me. It's, it's basically a profiled IP. It, it provides a reduced set of functions. There's no real IP routing in a, an ARIC 664 network, so it's, it's a really compact um, implementation of, of IP. And you also have a very compact implementation of ICMP. So that's the IP um, management protocol. Basically, that small block is providing the ping functionality, um, and, and that's it. Then you also have the UDP layer, uh, providing the access to the UDP ports. Then on top of that, you have the ARINC 653 layer, so that's providing the sampling and queuing type port functionality. And then other overhead protocols like uh, TFTP, file, a file transfer protocol to support uh, such things as uh, ARINC 615A data loads and then SNMP to do the network management. So to, um, that, that protocol is used to basically maintain network statistics and allow a, a manager in the network to query the end system for statistics like errors received, the, these sorts of things. <coughs>